And I'm Joe. And welcome to Lower the Bar with John and Joe. And today we're going to talk about a little bit more about who we are and kind of how we got here and what brought us to this place to do what we do today and why we're doing this podcast. So Joe, if you'd like to talk a little bit about it first, but first, I just want to thank all of our listeners that have emailed us and given us suggestions and topics. We really appreciate this. So again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we really got a lot of them. Considering it was our first podcast. Yes. It was amazing. So Joe, why don't you uh, just tell everyone a little bit about, you know, kind of how you got here and what you do. All right. Um, I began teaching at an Institute for Emotionally Disturbed Girls. And I taught there for 30 years as an English head of the English department and also health education. And I loved it. The first two years were really difficult till I realized that the girls weren't really angry at me. They're angry at life. And then I loved it after that. I really loved my time with them. We only had six in the class. So I got to know everybody quite well and very often took kids home for holidays that didn't have any place to go. And after that, after 30 years, I retired. That was about 12 years ago. And for about six years, my husband and I traveled a lot. Did all the traveling we didn't have time to do. But then I went to a meditation with my daughter at this place in East Greenbush. And I saw a sign on the wall that said, how would you like to become a certified hypnotist? And I thought to myself, are you kidding? Who'd want to do that? What is a hypnotist? I mean, yeah. they got some trickery or well, something. <laughs> yeah, there's they, unfortunately there in the past there's been a stigma yeah. attached oh, yeah. to it, or you know, influencing people unbeknownst to them and triggers, Manchurian candidate, you know, that whole thing. So. And I was standing by myself thinking, I can't even believe that sign's up there. Who would want to do that? And yet my guides kept saying, You want to do that. Maybe you don't want it now, but you need to do it. I kept saying, Wait, who's talking? I mean, I know my guides, but I couldn't believe this. <laughs> I told my daughter, and she said, Mom, you need to listen to your guides. And I thought, oh, my God, my daughter is very spiritual. So I considered it. Mm-hmm. And then I signed up for it. Oh. And so what it, really, what, like, what was the impulse to, at that moment? Listening it, to my guides. Really? Only listening to my guides okay. was my only impulse. I said, you know what? What if they told you to jump off a bridge? Well, I'm a good swimmer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but it wasn't. It was guiding no, me I I toward. I needed. I. I guess I didn't know I needed a new purpose. I always thought my teaching with the girls was my big purpose in life. Mm. But now that I'm a hypnotist, this is my big purpose now. And it just made me realize purposes change in life according to where you are in your life and how it suits your your lifestyle. So. You know, I just, I took the class within two hours. I knew this was for me. I signed up for the next class after a whole summer of studying, taking an exam. And I became a master or excuse me. I became a consulting hypnotist, but I knew there were things I didn't know, but I didn't know what I didn't know. What is it now? What is a consulting hypnotist? It's not a master hypnotist. It's it's a different level. Oh, I got you. It's it's like beginners. I've never heard that before. Yeah, that's usually what they're called. CH is consulting hypnotist. And I went to my first National Guild annual meeting in Massachusetts with all the hypnotists. It's international, actually. And I heard this man, as I was walking by a room to a class that I was signed up for, say... There is nothing wrong with depression. Mm. And I went, hmm, that's interesting. interesting. Yeah, and I stood yeah. there. I just got locked in my tracks outside his did. door. He said, there's nothing wrong with depression. If you think about it, depression is just what you feel when you've been frustrated by not satisfying any number of emotions in a healthy way. Right. Now you're frustrated. Mm-hmm. Beyond right. frustration right. is depression. Not the same thing as depression due to a chemical deficiency. So I I stood there and when he explained it, I said, wow, that makes sense. That makes depression much easier to wrap my head around and understand 
and work with as far as emotions, because I knew a lot at the time about emotions and, and the necessity to work through the ones that were bothering you. Anyway, I was so impressed with this man that I signed up for a two hour class with him the next day. And I said, that's it. I'm going to study with him. And within three months, I was signed up for his next class in Dallas, Texas, 10 hours a day for 10 days. I thought, I don't know if I'm going to live through this. <laughs> three hours did. of homework. But oh, my did. God. I absolutely loved it. Made some really good friends that I still keep in contact with. It was awesome. That's all you did. We ne We went out once and bought food for the week and put it in our coolers. We never had time to go out. We were either in class, doing homework, or crashed. <laughs> okay. And I became a master hypnotist. And then after that, I studied with him and took advanced courses. And I studied with other hypnotists to, to uh, become certified in past life and some soul work that I've done that's outside what Cal teaches. Cal is the name of Cal Banyan is the name of uh, my mentor in Texas. But I also studied that with him. So uh, I well, do you want, I'm sorry to interrupt, okay. but do you want to tell our audience that you're only one of seven board certified in the world? With Banyan Institute. Yes. I'm also yes. board certified by the national, the International <laughs> Guild of Hypnotists. So I have achieved most of the things because I felt like time is getting short, better get everything done. Plus, I love to learn. So I'm always learning new things. If anybody's interested in being a hypnotist, I'm telling you the institute that I belong to, please email me and I'll tell you about it. The learning is continuous. You have so much access to more information after you teach. And I'm now a certified teacher of the course that I took back then. And I teach twice a year um, in my office at Boston Lake, if anyone's interested. I have a class coming up in September. I only have about 10 more days that I'll accept new people because there's some prep work that you have to do for it. But if you are, just let me know. And tell us a little bit about you. Oh, that's, uh, that's a long story, but I'm going to make it as bearable as possible and as short as possible. Uh, Don't skip anything because <laughs> it's a really good one. Okay. Well, about eight years ago, uh, something happened to me. Actually, let me preface it by saying, before this event, uh, I didn't feel right. I had long-term memory, short-term memory loss, confusion, shaking, tremors, weird stuff in my body, sensations. Uh, I thought something was really wrong. Maybe I was terminal. I, I mean, I had no idea, but I didn't, it, I didn't feel right. And then one day, it was in the late morning, uh, I think I was on my way to a client and all of a sudden, I had to pull the car over. Something didn't feel right. And I had to pull the car over. And I did. And my feet were vibrating. Intensely, though. It wasn't just, oh, I'm feeling... I, now, I thought the car was running, but the car was off. And it got even more intense. And I, I wasn't scared. Yeah, but I wasn't scared. But definitely, I was thrown. I didn't know what was going on. And it worked its way up my legs into my waist and it came up my body and into my head. And I don't know what happened next. I, I, I think I blacked out. I don't remember. But when I came to, everything was different. I got my memory back, long-term, short-term, the shaking stopped, confusion. Uh, everything was sort of honed in and focused. Excuse me. Uh, I could see better, hear better. I could feel things. Like it was really strange. I, I, I can tell you, it didn't feel like me. I mean, it was me, but it didn't but feel it? like I. Well, at the time, I didn't know. Uh, so I called my family because I was a little nervous, and I thought my father could help me. And I called my dad, and he suggested I call my aunt, who had traveled the world after her husband died, to find herself and went to, you know, India and brought back these healers and went to all these places and held seminars in her home. And so he thought she'd be the great, you know, the great, you know, the person to talk to. So I called her up and she said, well, you need to talk to my friend Calvin, who she traveled the world with. And he was clairvoyant, clairaudient, medium, and his wife. So I called 
him. You know, she gave me his number um, and I called him and he picked up the phone and he had a very strange voice. It's kind of hard to listen to. He talked like this, John. Yes, John, something has happened to you, John. And I was like, oh, on, yeah. on. you know, like, <laughs> who am I talking to here? But he told me before I even said anything, oh, yes, John, something has happened to you. And I'm like, yeah, what am I possessed? And he's like, no, John, this is divine intervention. John. I'm like, oh, thank God, you know. And then he begins to just talk to me about things and tell me what's going on. And he called me a walk-in and I had no idea about any of this, way over my pay grade. And he, Did you, do you pray, John? Do you meditate? And, you know, he's saying all these questions. So, you know, we're talking for a little while and at the end, like, what am I going to do? You know, I'm asking him, like, wh where do I go from here? And in his tone, he goes, oh, John, well, John, it will all reveal itself to you, John. And I was like, you know, gee, thanks for the pearls. You know, I mean, like, that doesn't help me at all right now. But only to say that three days later, something happened. Uh, and I will tell you guys the story. I'm going to make this long story bearable, so bear with me. I was out in the Schoharie Valley, which is, we're in upstate New York near Saratoga. And I was out there and something is telling me I'm thirsty, but I'm not thirsty, but I'm thirsty. And I have to stop and get a water, but I'm not thirsty. Really strange. And we have stewards up here, a Pretty lot of weird. people know it as 7-Eleven or, you know, you're a convenience store. So I pull in and I get myself a water. And when I come out to get into my car, I notice there's a truck parked next to mine. And when I looked at it, it is old, beaten to crap. It's got rust all over the sides. It doesn't even have door handles. It's got like the cables hanging out. There's a Confederate flag in the back with shotgun racks and a ginormous mammoth of a man. He had to have been 6'5", six, 6'8", six, close to 350 pounds, 400 pounds, gut hitting the steering wheel, wearing overalls and a T-shirt, like a tank top, you know, that style. Oh boy. Yeah, that's it. In the middle With of- With hair all. In the middle of winter, like it's freezing out. His windows are down. And then next to him is a 90 pound, 90 pound blue nose pit bull with yellow eyes. Now I just put my dog down. So I, the dog was beautiful and it caught my eye. And I just said, oh, do you mind if I say hi to your dog? He doesn't acknowledge me. So I walk around and the dog's eyeballing me as I'm walking around the truck. And I go up to it and the window's down and it's freezing out and I can see his breath. And he's closer to, I'm closer to him than you are to me right now. And I'm just staring at him and he's just staring at me. And he's just staring at me with these yellow eyes. Now, I'd never seen a dog with yellow eyes. And did, did it, you feel like he was annoyed? something? No, 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 no. There was no aggression, but it was it was a little disconcerting because yeah. who puts their face in front of a pit bull? Like, you know, you that they've never met, uh, apparently. <laughs> so uh, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he just takes his tongue and goes thwap underneath my chin and slowly works his way up my face like this he's getting to know you he should put a mint under my pillow if that's the case <laughs> so anyway i get chicken skin after he's doing that I'm, I'm feeling really weird now i don't know what's going on and just i'm feeling this something's going on in my body similar to what happened to me you know before yeah, yeah. but different hair on the back like he's of talking to you. well I'll tell you. So the hair on the back of my neck is standing on end. I've got like chicken skin. And I turn to the guy and I don't even know why I said this. I'm like, listen, your dog saved your life. What? And I'm like, this dog saved your life. So he just, he doesn't, he's still not really acknowledging me. And then I just pause for a minute. And then all of a sudden I get this message and it's his mother. Now this has never happened to me. I, I, I don't know what's going on, but I'm getting this message and it's not like I'm hearing things, you know, I'm pretty grounded. Like, you know, it's not like I'm hearing voices in my head. It was, it was a message and it was from his mother. So I said, excuse me, I, 
this has never happened to me before, but I have a message from you, from your mother. And he, now he turns his head around. He goes, what? And I'm said, yeah, I have a message from your mother. He's like, oh yeah, my mother's dead like that. And I'm like, yeah, I know. And he's like, kind of sarcastic and a little aggressive goes, well, what does she want? Like that. So I pause and um, I don't know what this means, but she goes, I'm really sorry about the belt. And she was begging for his forgiveness. Well, I say that and he bursts into tears like a little baby and he just starts crying and bawling. Uh, and I'm like- Talk about uh, emotional resonance. Yes. So I'm a little wigged out right now because this is going on and the dog's getting agitated. So I put my arm around the dog. The dog's name is Conrad. I remember the dog. I can't remember, Bill, William, I can't remember the guy's name, but I put my arm around the dog and cause again, he's getting a little agitated. He's crying, bawling, crying. And I'm like, it's okay, it's okay. And I put my arm around him and it's okay. And, and I feel this on his side, he's got like this tumor, this goiter, something sticking out, but it was sticking out. It was like bigger than a golf ball. It was big. And I noticed it and I, I did, <laughs> Joe, I'm looking at the Confederate flag, the shotgun rack. And I turn to him and say, I don't like the looks of this. And he goes, what are you talking about? What? And I'm like, this tumor, I, I don't know what this is, but I don't like the looks of it. I'm going to take care of it for you right now. Yeah, exactly. Did you say to yourself, did I just say exactly. that? Exactly. I'm like kicking myself under the table, you know? When yeah. You get, like what? What am I getting myself into? Again, I'm looking at the shotgun rack. I'm like, oh my God, this man, you know, this guy could eat me for breakfast. <laughs> you know, what am I getting myself <laughs> into? Yes. So, but I'm not really thinking about that. I'm just going with this. And I'm thinking now about what Calvin, this guy had told me about meditation, prayer, and so I start to do that. I go inward. I kind of pray and, and begin to meditate on maybe, I, I don't know what I'm doing, but just I'm praying for this to go away. Just, I'm, I'm just praying for this to go away. I don't know why I'm doing this. Definitely you have Excuse me. intent. So, yes, but <laughs> serious. So I'm praying. I put my hand over. I like cut my hand and I kind of put it, I, I reach over and I put it over the goiter or tumor thing. And I begin to pray and I'm just praying and I'm doing that. And I'm like, you know, calling to God, asking him to. Are you out loud saying this? No, okay. no, but I'm thinking this in my head. So yeah. this is going on and I don't know how long I'm doing this for. And then all of a sudden, another message comes through. I'm like, okay. And I start letting out this guttural humming noise. I have no idea why I'm doing it. And you know, I sound like a Tibetan monk at this point, like chanting, you know, I'm just, and now I can't even imagine what he's thinking of I me right now, that, yeah. you know, so. He's not saying a word. Oh, no, no, no. He's totally quiet. He's just getting over, you know, cry, his crying episode. Yeah, yeah. And I remember what he told me to just pray and I'm doing that. And then this, again, this message comes through and I start, to I call it toning now. It's an ancient modality, but I'm letting out this guttural humming noise and I'm going up and down, like, like on a scale, mm -hmm. you know, up and I don't know why I'm doing this, but all of a sudden, after like a second, I hit a note, a frequency. And now my goosebumps have goosebumps. You know, I'm, <laughs> I talk about the hair on the back of my neck. I'm something is happening to me again. And I start feeling this pulsing in my arm. So I put it out and now I'm humming and, and toning, I call it. And praying for this dog. So I'm doing that. And I don't know, maybe five more minutes, 10 minutes goes by. And then all of a sudden, another message comes through. And the message was stop the blood flow to the tumor. Stop the blood flow to the tumor. So now I'm still letting out this toning. But now that's the, the sort of the intent or mm -hmm. the focus of my thoughts are stop the blood flow. So I did that for a while. And then something told me to stop. I knew to stop. So I Oh, I pull my hand away and, and it drops to the ground and it feels really heavy. I'm like, wow, this is crazy. This is very strange. So I walk away from the truck and I'm just shaking my hands out and just trying to get this energy out of it. And, I'm like, my hands away. 
And after a few minutes, it went away. And then I looked at my watch and I'm like, oh, I'm late for a client. I got to go. So I walked back to the truck and I said to the guy, why don't you give me your number? I don't have a phone. So I'm like, oh, okay. Well, here, why don't you take my card and my information and you can call me on someone else's phone. You know, I'm out here sometimes yeah. for clients. You know, I'll check in with you, blah, blah, blah. So I go to my car, I give him my card and I say, do you mind if I say goodbye to the dog? And he's like, no, no, go ahead. So now he's acknowledged me. So I walk around, same thing, dogs eyeballing me as I'm going around the truck. I get to it, same thing, staring at me, doesn't do anything. And then all of a sudden, thwap again, under my chin and goes up really slow. And I mean, slow, Joe, almost disconcerting. You're like, what is he doing? Right. Yeah, right. But I'm just, I let him do it. And I get the chicken skin again. But I'm thinking to myself, oh, no, 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 there's not more now. This, this has got to be it. And I'm like, I got to go. I'm late for a client. So I put my arm around the dog. And I put, I'm like, oh, okay, buddy, goodbye. And the tumor's gone. It's completely flat. There's a little bit of like a tiny, almost like a pimple, like the way you get like an underground, like you can like feel, <laughs> yeah, something, but just, but it was tiny, 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 but this thing was huge, completely flat. I burst into tears because I'm freaked out. Oh, I don't, I can understand. Oh yeah. That. This is shocking. This is the most profound moment of my life. Not the birth of my children. Not, like literally this hits me because if you had told me this, I would have said you're full of crap. I wouldn't believe you just but it's happening to me in real time. I'm looking at this thinking, this is a miracle. This is, this is crazy. This, this doesn't happen. Like this isn't supposed to happen. What is What's going on here? I'm completely out of my comfort zone. And now you're crying and late. Yes. So he turns to me and goes, Oh man. Oh no, no, no. It's okay. It's okay, man. No. Don't, no, don't worry about it with what went on here. I'm not surprised. So I stopped like that. I don't know why, but I don't know if it was his reassurance or whatever he was throwing my way. Interesting that now he's reassuring you. Yeah. So, but I came right out of it like a pin dropped. I could just, I pivoted and I was totally normal. I stopped crying instantly and felt grounded, which was great. And I said goodbye and I got back in my car and I just took a deep breath and I said out loud, I went, oh, okay. This is what he meant by it. So, so like I said, this was the most profound moment of my life and it impacted me incredibly. So for a number of years, I thought this is what I was meant to do. This was my mission. Well, now you said that uh, the dog saved his life, but you haven't told us how the dog saved his life. It didn't come to me. That was just the message. It didn't, I didn't get the explanation of why, how, it's just that he had. Or maybe, well, I'll tell you in a minute. Okay. So I thought my mission was, oh, before I go on to that, I forgot to end the story. So I stopped crying. He's like, well, with what you just told me, I'm not surprised. So he, he turns to me. And he says, thank you for saving my life. Hmm. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? Save your life? I, I don't even know what I did here, let alone save your life. What are you talking about? And he looks at me again, glaring at me, takes his glasses off and goes, no, no, no. Thank you for saving my life. And I'm like, okay, bud. Like, okay. And you're welcome. He reaches over, Joe, to the glove box. He pulled and he opens it up and he pulls out a 45. And he says to me, I was leaving, going to pull out of Stewart's, go back to my house, my property. I was going to shoot Conrad and then blow my brains out. That must have been, Conrad must be everything he has in life. Yes. yes. So whatever was going on in his world, whatever was closing in, anxiety, depression, who knows what he was suffering from at that moment, but everything pivoted at that mm -hmm. moment in his life and in mine. And 
getting back to the story is I thought I was meant to heal people. So I did. I reversed disease, kidney disease, mm -hmm. cancer, removed tumors. You, I could just go on and on. And then after a while, I realized that, well, if that happens exponentially, great, but that's not really what I'm here to do. And what I realized was that I am given a specific download, so to speak, for someone, information that gives them a template to do the inner work. Because we all have a curriculum and mm -hmm. we don't know what our what the theorem is to that. That's that's our journey here is to figure that out. But I am given that information for you specific or anybody. And as long as they're willing to do the work, yes. then, or we are willing to very, do the work. Very, 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 very important that we understand that. Mm -hmm. And and we're going to go into it in other broad, uh, you know, other podcasts, but your participation as opposed to allopathic medicine, which again, puts the responsibility outside yourself, you're depending on someone else to do it for you. Even though I am a part of that narrative, you're doing the work as well, because it's also inner work. We have cell Absolutely. memory, you know, emotional resonance, and we hold on to things which trigger our bodies, our cells to manifest disease and other mm -hmm you know, inflammations and uh, other issues in the body. So it, when you participate in this, you begin to take control. Especially when you have an awareness and then you know what to do to get where you want to go. I know in my practice too, um, my clients have to do the work. They have to be willing to follow yes. my directions and do the work and they do homework. They have to agree to that yes. in our first session or I don't take them on. Right. Well, that's why we align so much mm -hmm. because- the belief in, in responsibility mm -hmm. and the work that we have to do internally for ourselves and to work on. And I'm here to tell you guys that it's really not that hard. It's not easy. <laughs> I'm not going to fluff it up and tell you it's easy work. It's freaking hard, but it's not that hard to get there. No. The template to do the work is pretty simple. You know, we, we complicate everything. You know, again, we're our worst enemies. We sabotage ourselves. We make it difficult on ourselves. And it's all based on what we feel we deserve and how we value ourselves. We've also been taught that, oh, you can't do that by yourself. Well, yes. You need outside well, help. And it's not true. Right. The minute we pop out of the womb, yeah. we are codependent. We live in a world of codependency. Even from, you know, our child rearing years, our parents um, influence, it just continues our yeah, whole even life. Even in relationships. Yes, yes. So um, that's that's really important to know. And, and again, that's what we're here for. We're going to, in future podcasts, bring all of these kinds of issues to the forefront so you can understand how to work on yourself and mm -hmm. what you can do, because it really isn't that hard to figure it out what's hard is the work the first thing is believing well yes believing that you can do it believing that you have everything you need inside right there. of you when you do and then accept some guidance receive the messages and do the work and yes. it, it's you just feel so good about being alive and you feel impactful on others because you're together and you learn to love yourself value yourself and it just changes your life. Yes. So on our next podcast, we are going to talk about uh, empaths and emotional resonance. Begin to talk about that and identifying uh, if you're an empath and how to understand it and identify it and then be able to integrate it and then let it work for you as opposed to impacting you in a way that isn't healthy. I want to talk about the book. Okay, well, you better hurry up because we only have a minute left. Okay. Here. Okay, well, no okay. worries. I got it. Okay. This is the book that we're going to be talking about. I've read a lot about empaths because I am an empath. John's an empath. We're going to talk a lot about that. If you feel that you take on other people's feelings, please get this book. I've read so many, and this is fantastic. Judith Orloff's 
the Empath Survival Guide. It's a very easy read, but there's so much information in it. I would love everyone to come to the table with a little more information if they're interested next time. Great. Beautiful. Well, we would love to talk more, but we're running out of time. So we'd like to thank everybody for tuning in today. And we look forward to you guys tuning in for our next podcast. And please contact us at lowerthebar at gmail.com. Please. If you have any comments, thank you. Yes. And we really appreciate you tuning in. And thank you for the privilege of your time because I know we all have busy days and so much going on in our world. And we are just here to spread love and information so you can find your power and really be happy and create and manifest a world that brings you guys what you need. So thanks again. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Have a great week.